Chapter Six of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume Six by Eugène Sue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Father and Daughter, Part One. Ignorant of Fleur de Marie's being the prince's daughter, Madame d'Arville, in the fullness of her delight at restoring to him his protege, had not reckoned upon its being necessary to observe any particular precaution in presenting her young companion whom she merely left in the carriage until she had ascertained whether rodolph chose to make known his real name and rank to the object of his bounty and to receive her at his own house but perceiving the deep alteration in his features and struck with the visible gloom which overspread them as well as the marks of recent tears so evident in his sunken eye clemence became alarmed with the idea that some fresh misfortune greater than the loss of la goualeuse would be considered had suddenly occurred wholly losing sight therefore of the original cause of her visit she anxiously exclaimed for heaven's sake my lord what has happened do you not know madame then all hope is at an end alas your earnest manner the interview so unexpectedly sought by you all made me believe let me entreat of you not to think for a moment of the cause of my visit but in the name of that parent whose life you have preserved i adjure you to explain to me the cause of the deep affliction in which i find you plunged your paleness your dejection terrify me oh be generous my lord and relieve the cruel anxiety i suffer wherefore should i burden your kind heart with the relation of woes that admit of no relief your words your hesitation but increase my apprehensions oh my lord i beseech you tell me all sir walter will you not take pity on my fears for the love of heaven explain the meaning of all this what has befallen the prince nay interrupted rodolph in a voice that vainly struggled for firmness since you desire it madame learn that since i acquainted you with the death of fleur de marie i have learned she was my own daughter your daughter exclaimed clemence in a tone impossible to describe fleur de marie your daughter and when just now you desired to see me to communicate tidings that would fill me with joy pardon and pity the weakness of a parent half distracted at the loss of his newly found treasure i ventured to hope but no no i see too plainly i was mistaken forgive me my brain seems wandering and i scarce know what i say or do and then sinking under the failure of this last fond imagination of his heart and unable longer to struggle with his black despair rodolph threw himself back in his chair and covered his face with his hands while madame d'harville astonished at what she had just heard remained motionless and silent scarcely able to breathe amid the conflicting emotions which took possession of her mind at one instant glowing with delight at the thoughts of the joy she had it in her power to impart then trembling for the consequences her explanation might produce on the over-excited mind of the prince both these reflections were however swallowed up in the enthusiastic gratitude which she felt in the consideration that to her had been deputed the happiness not only of announcing to the grief-stricken father that his child still lived but that the unspeakable rapture of placing that daughter in her parents arms was likewise vouchsafed to her carried away by a burst of pious thankfulness and wholly forgetting the presence of rodolph and murphy madame d'harville threw herself on her knees and clasping her hands exclaimed in a tone of fervent piety and ineffable gratitude thanks thanks my god for this exceeding goodness ever blessed be thy gracious name for having permitted me to be the happy bearer of such joyful tidings to wipe away a father's tears by telling him his child lives to reward his tenderness although these words pronounced with the sincerest fervour and holy ecstasy were uttered almost in a whisper yet they reached the listening ears of rodolph and his faithful squire and as clemence rose from her knees the prince gazed on her lovely countenance irradiated as it was with celestial happiness and beaming with more than earthly beauty with an expression almost amounting to adoration supporting herself with one hand while with the other she sought to still the rapid beating of her heart madame d'harville replied by a sweet smile and an affirmative inclination of the head to the eager soul-searching look of rodolph a look wholly beyond our poor powers to describe and where is she exclaimed the prince trembling like a leaf in my carriage but for the intervention of murphy who threw himself before rodolph with the quickness of lightning 
the latter would have rushed to the vehicle would you kill her my lord exclaimed the squire forcibly retaining the prince she was merely pronounced convalescent yesterday added clemence therefore as you value her safety do not venture to try the poor girl's strength too far you are right said rodolph scarcely able to restrain himself sufficiently to follow this prudent advice you are quite right yes i will be calm i will not see her at present i will wait until her first emotions have subsided oh tis too much to endure in so short a space of time then addressing madame d'harville he said in an agitated tone while he extended to her his hand i feel that i am pardoned and that you are the angel of forgiveness who brings me the glad tidings of my remission nay my lord we do but mutually requite our several obligations you preserve to me my father and heaven permits me to restore your daughter at a time you bewailed her as lost but i too must beg to be excused for the weakness which resists all my endeavours to control it the sudden and unexpected news you have communicated to me has quite overcome me and i confess i should not have sufficient command over myself to go in quest of fleur de marie my emotion would terrify her and by what means was she preserved exclaimed rodolph and whose hand snatched her from death i am most ungrateful not to have put these questions to you earlier she was rescued from drowning by a courageous female who snatched her from a watery grave just as she was sinking do you know who this female was i do and to-morrow she will be at my house the debt is immense rejoined the prince but i will endeavour to repay it heaven must have inspired me with the idea of leaving fleur de marie in the carriage said the marquise had i brought her in with me the shock must have killed her now then said the prince who had been for some minutes occupied in endeavouring to subdue his extreme agitation i can promise you my kind friends that i have my feelings sufficiently under control to venture to meet my my daughter go murphy and fetch her to my longing arms rodolph pronounced the word daughter with a tenderness of voice and manner impossible to describe are you quite sure you are equal to the trying scene my lord inquired clemence for we must run no risks with one in fleur de marie's delicate state oh yes yes be under no alarm i am too well aware of the dangerous consequences any undue emotion would occasion my child be assured i will not expose her to anything of the sort but go go my good murphy i beseech you hasten to bring her hither don't be alarmed madame said the squire who had attentively scrutinized the countenance of the prince she may come now without danger i am quite sure that his royal highness will sufficiently command himself then go go my faithful friend you are keeping me in torments just give me one minute my lord said the excellent creature drying the moisture from his eyes i must not let the poor thing see i have been crying there there that will do i should not like to cross the antechamber looking like a weeping magdalen so saying the squire proceeded towards the door but suddenly turning back he said but my lord what am i to say to her yes what had he better say inquired the prince of clemence that m rodolph wishes to see her nothing more oh to be sure how stupid of me not to think of that m rodolph wishes to see her capital excellent repeated the squire who evidently partook of madame d'harville's nervousness and sought to defer the moment of his embassy by one little pretext and the other that will not give her the least suspicion not the shadow of a notion what she is wanted for nothing better could have been suggested but still murphy stirred not sir walter said clemence smiling you are afraid well i won't deny it said the squire and in spite of my standing six feet high i feel and know i am trembling like a child then take care my good fellow said rodolph you had better wait a little longer if you do not feel quite sure of yourself no no my lord i have got the upper hand of my fears this time replied murphy pressing his two herculean fists to his eyes i know very well that at my time of life it is ridiculous for me to show such weakness i'm going my lord don't you be uneasy so saying murphy left the room with a firm step and composed countenance 
a momentary silence followed his departure and then for the first time clemence remembered she was alone with the prince and under his roof rodolph drew near to her and said with an almost timid voice and manner if i select this day this hour to divulge to you the dearest secret of my heart it is that the solemnity of the present moment may give greater weight to that i would impart and persuade you to believe me sincere when i assure you i have loved you almost from the hour i first beheld you while obstacles stood in the way of my love i studiously concealed it but you are now free to hear me declare my affection and to ask you to become a mother to the daughter you restore to me my lord cried madame d'harville what words are these oh refuse me not said rodolph tenderly let this day decide the happiness of my future life clemence had also nourished a deep and sincere passion for the prince and his open manly avowal of a similar feeling towards herself made under such peculiar circumstances transported her with joy and she could but falter out in a hesitating voice my lord tis for me to remind you of the difference of our stations and the interests of your sovereignty permit me first to consider the interest of my own heart and that of my beloved child oh make us both happy by consenting to be mine so that i who but a short time since owned no blessed tie may now proudly indulge in the idea of having both a wife and daughter and give to the sorrowing child who is just restored to my arms the delight of saying my father my mother my sister for your sweet girl would become mine also ah oh, my lord exclaimed clemence my grateful tears alone can speak my sense of such noble conduct then suddenly checking herself she added i hear persons approaching my lord your daughter comes refuse me not i conjure you responded rodolph in an agitated and suppliant tone by the love i bear you i beseech you to make me happy by saying our daughter comes then be it our daughter if such is your sincere wish murmured clemence as murphy throwing open the door introduced fleur de marie into the salon the astonished girl had upon entering the immense hotel from the spacious portico under which she alighted from the marquise's carriage first crossed an ante-room filled with servants dressed in rich liveries then a waiting-room in which were other domestics belonging to the establishment also wearing the magnificent livery of the house of gerolstein and lastly the apartment in which the chamberlain and aide-de-camp of the prince attended his orders the surprise and wonder of the poor goualeuse whose ideas of splendour were based on the recollection of the farm at bouqueval as she traversed those princely chambers glittering with gold silver paintings and mirrors may easily be imagined directly she appeared madame d'harville ran towards her kindly took her hand and throwing her arm around her waist as though to support her led her towards rodolph who remained supporting himself by leaning one arm on the chimney-piece wholly incapable of advancing a single step having consigned fleur de marie to the care of madame d'harville murphy hastily retreated behind one of the large window curtains not feeling too sure of his own self-command at the sight of him who was in the eyes of fleur de marie not only her benefactor but the worshipped idol of her heart the poor girl whose delicate frame had been so severely tried by illness became seized with a universal trembling compose yourself my child said madame d'harville see there is your kind monsieur rodolph who has been extremely uneasy on your account and is most anxious to see you oh yes uneasy indeed stammered forth rodolph whose breast was wrung with anguish at the sight of his child's pale suffering looks in spite of his previous resolution the prince found himself compelled to turn away his head to conceal his deep emotion my poor child said madame d'harville striving to divert the attention of fleur de marie you are still very weak and leading her to a large gilded armchair she made her sit down while the astonished goualeuse seemed almost to shrink from touching the elegant cushions with which it was lined but she did not recover herself on the contrary she seemed oppressed she strove to speak but her voice failed her 
and her heart reproached her with not having said one word to her venerated benefactor of the deep gratitude which filled her whole soul at length at a sign from madame d'harville who leaning over fleur de marie held one of the poor girl's thin wasted hands in hers the prince gently approached the side of the chair and now more collected he said to fleur de marie as she turned her sweet face to welcome him at last my child your friends have recovered you and be sure it is not their intention ever to part with you again one thing you must endeavour to do and that is to banish for ever from your mind all your past sufferings yes my dear girl said clemence you can in no way so effectually prove your affection for your friends as by forgetting the past ah monsieur rodolphe and you too madame pray believe that if in spite of myself my thoughts do revert to the past it will be but to remind me that but for you that wretched past would still be my lot but we shall take pains to prevent such mournful reminiscences ever crossing your mind our tenderness will not allow you time to look back my dear marie said rodolphe you know i gave you that name at the farm oh yes monsieur rodolphe i will remember you did and madame georges who was so good as even to permit me to call her mother is she quite well perfectly so my child but i have some most important news for you since i last saw you some great discoveries have been made respecting your birth we have found out who were your parents and your father is known to us the voice of rodolph trembled so much while pronouncing these words that fleur de marie herself deeply affected turned quickly towards him but fortunately he managed to conceal his countenance from her a somewhat ridiculous occurrence also served at this instant to call off the attention of the goualeuse from too closely observing the prince's emotion the worthy squire who still remained behind the curtain feigning to be very busily occupied in gazing upon the garden belonging to the hotel suddenly blew his nose with a twanging sound that re-echoed through the salon for in truth the worthy man was crying like a child yes my dear marie said clemence hastily your father is known to us he is still living my father cried la goualeuse in a tone of tender delight that subjected the firmness of rodolphe to another difficult test and some day continued clemence perhaps very shortly you will see him but what will no doubt greatly astonish you is that he is of high rank and noble birth and my mother shall i not see her too madame that is a question your father will answer my dear child but tell me shall you not be delighted to see him oh yes madame answered fleur de marie casting down her eyes how much you will love him when you know him said clemence a new existence will commence for you from that very day will it not marie asked the prince oh no monsieur rodolphe replied fleur de marie artlessly my new existence began when you took pity on me and sent me to the farm but your father loves you fondly dearly said the prince i know nothing of my father monsieur rodolphe but to you i owe everything in this world and the next then you love me better perhaps than you would your father oh monsieur rodolphe i revere and bless you with all my heart for you have been a saviour and preserver to me both of body and soul replied la goualeuse with a degree of fervour and enthusiasm that overcame her natural diffidence when this kind lady was so good as to visit me in prison i said to her as i did to every one else oh if you have any trouble only let m rodolphe know it and he will be sure to relieve you and when i saw any person hesitating between good and evil i used to advise them to try and be virtuous telling them m rodolphe always found a way to punish the wicked and to such as were far gone in sin i said take care m rodolphe will recompense you as you deserve and even when i thought myself dying i felt comfort in persuading myself that god would pity and pardon me since m rodolphe had deigned to do so carried away by her intense feelings of gratitude and reverence for her benefactor fleur de marie broke through her habitual timidity while thus expressing herself a bright flush coloured her pale cheeks while her soft blue eyes raised towards heaven as though in earnest prayer shone with unusual brilliancy 
a silence of some seconds succeeded to this burst of enthusiasm while the spectators of the scene were too deeply affected to attempt a reply it seems then my dear child said rodolph at length that i have almost usurped your parents place in your affections indeed monsieur rodolph i cannot help it perhaps it is very wrong in me to prefer you as i do but i know you and my father is a stranger to me then letting her head fall on her bosom she added in a low confused manner and besides monsieur rodolph though you are acquainted with the past you have loaded me with kindness while my father is ignorant of of my shame and may probably regret when he does know having found an unfortunate creature like myself and then too continued the poor girl with a shudder madame tells me he is of high birth how then can he look upon me without shame and aversion shame exclaimed rodolph drawing himself up with proud dignity no no my poor child your grateful happy father will raise you to a position so great so brilliant that the richest and highest in the land shall behold you with respect despise and blush for you never you shall take your place among the first princesses of europe and prove yourself worthy of the blood of queens which flows in your veins my lord my lord cried clemence and murphy at the same time equally alarmed at the excited manner of rodolph and the increasing paleness of fleur de marie who gazed on her father in silent amazement ashamed of you continued he oh if ever i rejoiced in my princely rank it is now that it affords me the means of raising you from the depths to which the wickedness of others consigned you yes my child my long-lost idolized child in me behold your father and utterly unable longer to repress his feelings the prince threw himself at the feet of fleur de marie and covered her hand with tears and caresses thanks my god exclaimed fleur de marie passionately clasping her hands for permitting me to indulge that love for my benefactor with which my heart was filled my father o oh, blessed title that enables me to love him even as i and unable to bear up against the suddenness of the disclosure fleur de marie fell fainting in the prince's arms murphy rushed to the waiting-room and shouted vehemently send for dr david directly directly do you hear for his royal highness no no for some one who is suddenly taken ill here wretch that i am exclaimed rodolph sobbing almost hysterically at his daughter's feet i have killed her marie my child look up it is your father who calls you forgive oh forgive my precipitancy my want of caution in disclosing to you this happy news she is dead god of heaven have i then but found her to see her torn from me for ever calm yourself my lord said clemence there is no danger depend upon it the colour returns to her cheeks the surprise overcame her but so recently risen from a bed of sickness that surprise may kill her unhappy man that i am doomed for ever to misery and suffering at this moment the negro doctor david entered the room in great haste holding in one hand a small case filled with files and in the other a paper he handed to murphy david exclaimed rodolph my child is dying i once saved your life repay me now by saving that of my daughter although amazed at hearing the prince speak thus david hurried to fleur de marie whom madame d'harville was supporting in her arms examined her pulse and the veins of her temples then turning towards rodolph who in speechless agony was awaiting his decree he said your royal highness has no cause for alarm there is no danger can it be true are you quite sure she will recover perfectly so my lord a few drops of ether administered in a glass of water is all that is requisite to restore consciousness thanks thanks my good my excellent david cried the prince in an ecstasy of joy then addressing clemence rodolph added our daughter will be spared to us murphy had just glanced over the paper given him by david suddenly he started and gazed with looks of terror at the prince yes my old and faithful friend cried rodolph misinterpreting the expression of murphy's features ere long my daughter will enjoy the happiness of calling the marquise d'harville mother 
yesterday's news said murphy trembling violently was false what say you the report of the death of the countess macgregor my lord is unfounded her ladyship had undergone a severe crisis of her illness and had fallen into a state of insensibility which was mistaken by those around her for death itself and from hence originated the account of her having expired but to-day hopes are entertained of her ultimate recovery merciful heavens can this be possible exclaimed the prince filled with sudden alarm while clemence who understood nothing of all this looked on with undisguised astonishment my lord said david still occupied with fleur de marie there is no need of the slightest apprehension respecting this young lady but it is absolutely necessary she should be in the open air this chair might be easily rolled out on the terrace by opening the door leading to the garden she would then immediately recover consciousness murphy instantly ran to open the glass door which led to a broad terrace then aided by david he gently rolled the armchair on to it alas cried rodolph as soon as murphy and david were at a distance you have yet to learn that the countess sarah is the mother of fleur de marie and i believed her dead a few moments of profound silence followed madame d'harville became deadly pale while an icy coldness seemed to chill her heart let me briefly explain continued rodolph in extreme agitation mingled with bitter sarcasm that this ambitious and selfish woman caring for nothing but my rank and title contrived during my extreme youth to draw me into a secret marriage which was afterwards annulled being desirous of contracting a second marriage the countess occasioned all the misfortunes of her unhappy child by abandoning her to the care of mercenary and unprincipled people now i can account for the repugnance you manifested towards her and you may likewise understand why she so bitterly pursued you and had twice so nearly effected your destruction by her infamous slanders still a prey to her insatiate ambition she hoped by separating me from any other attachment to draw me a second time within her snares and this heartless woman still exists nay nay my lord that tone of bitter regret is not worthy of you any more than the feeling which dictated it you do not know the wretchedness she has already caused me and even now that i had dared to dream of happiness and looked forward to obtaining anew the comfort and solace of my life as well as a mother for my newly recovered child this woman again crosses my path and like the spirit of evil dashes the cup from my lips ere it is tasted come come my lord said poor clemence striving to look cheerful though her tears flowed fast spite of all her efforts to restrain them take courage you have a great and holy duty to perform but just now when impelled by a natural burst of paternal affection you said that the future destiny of your daughter should be happy and prosperous as her past life had been the reverse that you would elevate her in the eyes of the world even more than she had been sunken and depressed to do this you must legitimize her birth and the only means by which that can be achieved is by espousing the countess macgregor never never that would be to reward the perjury selfishness and unbridled ambition of the unnatural mother of my poor child but marie shall not suffer by my resolution i will publicly acknowledge her you will kindly take her under your protection and i venture to hope afford her a truly maternal shelter no my lord you will not act thus you will not permit the cloud of doubt or mystery to hang over the birth of your daughter the countess sarah is descended from an ancient and noble family such an alliance is certainly disproportionate for you but still is an honourable one it will effectually legitimise your daughter and whatever may be her future destiny she will have cause to boast of her father and openly declare who was her mother but think not i can or will resign you it were easier to lay down my life than surrender the blessed hope of dividing my time and affection between two beings i so dearly love as yourself and my daughter your child will still remain to you my lord providence has miraculously restored her to you it would be sore ingratitude on your part to deem your happiness incomplete you could not argue thus if you loved as i love i will not undeceive you 
great as is your error on the contrary i would have you persist in that belief it will make the task i recommend less painful to you but if you really loved me if you suffered as bitterly and severely as i do at the thoughts of my marrying another you would be wretched as i am what will console you for our separation my lord i shall try to find solace in the discharge of my charitable duties duties i first learned to love and practise from your counsels and suggestions and which have already afforded me so much consolation and sweet occupation hear me i beseech you since you tell me it is right i will marry this woman but the sacrifice once accomplished think not i will remain a single hour with her or suffer her to behold my child thus fleur de marie will lose in you the best and tenderest of mothers but she will still retain the best and tenderest of fathers by your marriage with the countess sarah she will be the legitimate daughter of one of europe's sovereign princes and as you but just now observed my lord her position will be as great and splendid as it has been miserable and obscure you are then pitilessly determined to shut out all hope from me unhappy being that i am dare you style yourself unhappy you so good so just so elevated in rank as well as in mind and feeling who so well and nobly understand the duty of self-denial and self-sacrifice when but a short time since you bewailed your child's death with such heartfelt agony had any one said to you utter the dearest wish of your soul and it shall be accomplished you would have cried my child my daughter restore her to me in life and health this unexpected blessing is granted you your daughter is given to your longing arms and yet you style yourself miserable ah my lord let not fleur de marie hear you i beseech you you are right said rodolph after a long silence such happiness as i aspired to would have been too much for this world and far beyond my right even to dream of be satisfied your words have prevailed i will act according to my duty to my daughter and forget the bleeding wound it inflicts on my own heart but i am not sorry i hesitated in my resolution since i owe to it a fresh proof of the perfection of your character and is it not to you i owe the power of struggling with personal feelings and devoting myself to the good of others was it not you who raised and comforted my poor depressed mind and encouraged me to look for comfort where only it could be found to you then be all the merit of the little virtue i may now be practising as well as all the good i may hereafter achieve but take courage my lord bear up as becomes one of your firm right-minded nature directly fleur de marie is equal to the journey remove her to germany once there she will benefit so greatly by the grave tranquillity of the country that her mind and feelings will be soothed and calmed down to a placidity and gentle enjoyment of the present while the past will seem but as a troubled dream but you you ah i may confess with joy and pride that my love for you will be as it were a shield of defence from all snares and temptations a guardian angel that will preserve me from all that could assail me in body or mind then i shall write to you daily pardon me this weakness tis the only one i shall allow myself you my lord will also write to me occasionally if but to give me intelligence of her whom once at least i called my daughter said clemence melting into tears at the thoughts of all she was giving up and who will ever be fondly cherished in my heart as such and when advancing years shall permit me fearlessly and openly to avow the regard which binds us to each other then my lord i vow by your daughter that if you desire it i will establish myself in germany in the same city you yourself inhabit never again to quit you but so to end a life which might have been passed more agreeably as far as our earthly feelings were concerned but which shall at least have been spent in the practice of every noble and virtuous feeling my lord exclaimed murphy entering with eagerness she whom heaven has restored to you has regained her senses her first word upon recovering consciousness was to call for you my father my beloved father she cried oh do not take me from him come to her my lord she is all impatience again to behold you a few minutes after this madame d'harville quitted the prince's hotel while the latter repaired in all haste to the house of the countess macgregor accompanied by murphy baron de grone and an aide-de-camp 
End of chapter 6 Read by Celine Major Chapter 7 of The Mysteries of Paris, Volume 6 by Eugène Sue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Marriage From the moment in which she had learnt from Rodolphe the violent death of Fleur de Marie, Sarah had felt crushed and borne down by a disclosure so fatal to all her ambitious hopes. Tortured equally by a too late repentance, she had fallen into a fearful nervous attack attended even by delirium her partially healed wound opened afresh and a long continuation of fainting fits gave rise to the supposition of her death yet still the natural strength of her constitution sustained her even amid this severe shock and life seemed to struggle vigorously against death seated in an easy chair the better to relieve herself from the sense of suffocation which oppressed her sarah had remained for some time plunged in bitter reflections almost amounting to regrets that she had been permitted to escape from almost certain death suddenly the door of the invalid's chamber opened and thomas seyton entered evidently struggling to restrain some powerful emotion hastily waving his hand for the countess's attendants to retire he approached his sister who seemed scarcely to perceive her brother's presence how are you now inquired he much the same i feel very weak and have at times a most painful sensation of being suffocated why was i not permitted to quit this world during my late attack sarah replied thomas seyton after a momentary silence you are hovering between life and death any violent emotion might destroy you or recall your feeble powers and restore you to health there can be no further trial for me brother you know not that i could now even hear that rodolph were dead without a shock the pale spectre of my murdered child murdered through my instrumentality is ever before me it creates not mere emotion but a bitter and ceaseless remorse oh brother i have known the feelings of a mother only since i have become childless i own i liked better to find you in that cold calculating ambition that made you regard your daughter but as a means of realizing the dream of your whole existence that ambition fell to the ground crushed for ever beneath the overwhelming force of the prince's reproaches and the picture drawn by him of the horrors to which my child had been exposed awakened in my breast all a mother's tenderness and how said satan hesitatingly and laying deep emphasis on each word he uttered if by a miracle a chance an almost impossibility your daughter were still living tell me how you would support such a discovery i should expire of shame and despair no such thing you would be but too delighted at the triumph such a circumstance would afford to your ambition for had your daughter survived the prince would beyond a doubt have married you and admitting the miracle you speak of could happen i should have no right to live but so soon as the prince had bestowed on me the title of his consort my duty would have been to deliver him from an unworthy spouse and my daughter from an unnatural mother the perplexity of thomas satan momentarily increased commissioned by rodolph who was waiting in an adjoining room to acquaint sarah that fleur de marie still lived he knew not how to proceed so feeble was the state of the countess's health that an instant might extinguish the faint spark that still animated her frame and he saw that any delay in performing the nuptial rite between herself and the prince might be fatal to every hope determined to legitimize the birth of fleur de marie by giving every necessary formality to the ceremony the prince had brought with him a clergyman to perform the sacred service and two witnesses in the persons of murphy and baron de groen the duc de lucenay and lord douglas hastily summoned by satan had arrived to act as attesting witnesses on the part of the countess each moment became important but the remorse of sarah mingled as it was with a maternal tenderness that had entirely replaced the fiery ambition that once held sway in her breast rendered the task of satan still more difficult he could but hope that his sister deceived either herself or him and that her pride and vanity would rekindle in all their former brightness at the prospect of the crown so long and ardently coveted sister resumed satan in a grave and solemn voice i am placed in a situation of cruel perplexity i could utter one word of such deep importance that it might save your life or stretch you a corpse at my feet i have already told you nothing in this world can move me more yes one 
one event my sister and what is that your daughter's welfare i have no longer a child she is dead but if she were not cease brother such useless suppositions we exhausted that subject some minutes since leave me to unavailing regrets nay but i cannot so easily persuade myself that if by some almost incredible chance some unhoped for aid your daughter had been snatched from death and still lived i beseech you talk not thus to me you know not what i suffer then listen to me sister while i declare that as the almighty shall judge you and pardon me your daughter lives lives said you my child lives i did and truly so the prince with a clergyman and the necessary witnesses awaits in the adjoining chamber i have summoned two of our friends to act as our witnesses the desire of your life is at length accomplished the prediction fulfilled and you are wedded to royalty as thomas satan slowly uttered the concluding part of his speech he observed with indescribable uneasiness the want of all expression in his sister's countenance the marble features remained calm and imperturbable and her only sign of attending to her brother's words was a sudden pressure of both hands to her heart as if to still its throbbing or as though under the influence of some acute pain while a stifled cry escaping her trembling lips as she fell back in her chair but the feeling whatever it was soon passed away and sarah became fixed rigid and tranquil as before sister cried satan what ails you shall i call for assistance tis nothing merely the result of surprise and joy at the unhoped-for tidings you have communicated to me at last then the dearest wish of my heart is accomplished i was not mistaken thought satan ambition still reigns paramount in her heart and will carry her in safety through this trial well sister said he aloud what did i tell you you were right replied she with a bitter smile as she penetrated the workings of her brother's thoughts ambition has again stifled the voice of maternal tenderness within me you will live long and happily to cherish and delight in your daughter doubtless i shall brother see how calm i am ah but is your tranquillity real or assumed feeble and exhausted can you imagine it possible for me to feign you can now understand the difficulty i felt in breaking this news to you nay i marvel at it knowing as you did the extent of my ambition where is the prince he is here i would fain see and speak with him before the ceremony then with affected indifference she added and my daughter is also here as a matter of course she is not here at present you will see her by and by true there is no hurry but send for the prince i entreat of you sister i know not why but your manner alarms me and there is a strangeness in your very looks as well as words and satan spoke truly the very absence of all emotion in sarah inspired him with a vague and indefinable uneasiness he even fancied he saw her eyes filled with tears she hastily repressed but unable to account for his own suspicions he at once quitted the chamber now then said sarah if i may but see and embrace my daughter i shall be satisfied i fear there will be some considerable difficulty in obtaining that happiness rodolph will refuse me as a punishment for the past but i must and will accomplish my longing desire oh yes i cannot will not be denied but the prince comes rodolph entered and carefully closed the door after him addressing sarah in a cold constrained manner he said i presume your brother has told you all he has and your ambition is satisfied quite quite satisfied every needful preparation for our marriage has been made the minister and attesting witnesses are in the next room i know it they may enter may they not madame one word my lord i wish to see my daughter that is impossible i repeat my lord that i earnestly desire to see my child she is but just recovering from a severe illness and she has undergone one violent shock to-day the interview you ask might be fatal to her nay my lord she may be permitted to embrace her mother without danger to herself why should she run the risk you are now a sovereign princess 
not yet my lord nor do i intend to be until i have embraced my daughter rodolph gazed on the countess with unfeigned astonishment is it possible cried he that you can bring yourself to defer the gratification of your pride and ambition till i have indulged the greater gratification of a mother's feelings does that surprise you my lord it does indeed and shall i see my daughter i repeat have a care my lord the moments are precious mine are possibly numbered as my brother said the present trial may kill or cure me i am now struggling with all my power with all the energy i possess against the exhaustion occasioned by the discovery just made to me i demand to see my daughter or otherwise i refuse the hand you offer me and if i die before the performance of the marriage ceremony her birth can never be legitimized but fleur de marie is not here i must send for her then do so instantly and i consent to everything you may propose and as i repeat my minutes are probably numbered the marriage can take place while they are conducting my child hither although tis a matter of surprise to hear such sentiments from you yet they are too praiseworthy to be treated with indifference you shall see fleur de marie i will write to her to come directly right there on that desk where i received my death-blow while rodolph hastily penned a few lines the countess wiped from her brows the cold damps that had gathered there while her hitherto calm and unmovable features were contracted by a sudden spasmodic agony which had increased in violence from having been so long concealed the letter finished rodolph arose and said to the countess i will dispatch this letter by one of my aides-de-camp she will be here in half an hour from the time my messenger departs shall i upon my return to you bring the clergyman and persons chosen to witness our marriage that we may at once proceed you may but no let me beg of you to ring the bell do not leave me by myself let sir walter despatch the letter and then return with the clergyman rodolph rang one of sarah's attendants answered the summons request my brother to send sir walter murphy here said the countess in a faint voice the woman went to perform her mistress's bidding this marriage is a melancholy affair rodolph said the countess bitterly i mean as far as i am concerned to you it will be productive of happiness the prince started at the idea nay be not astonished at my prophesying happiness to you from such a union but i shall not live to mar your joys at this moment murphy entered my good friend said the prince send this letter off to my daughter colonel blank will be the bearer of it and he can bring her back in my carriage then desire the minister and all concerned in witnessing the marriage ceremony to assemble in the adjoining room god of mercy cried sarah fervently clasping her hands as the squire disappeared grant me strength to fold my child to my heart let me not die ere she arrives alas why were you not always the tender mother you now are thanks to you at least for awakening in me a sincere repentance for the past and a hearty desire to devote myself to the good of those whose happiness i have so fearfully disturbed yes when my brother told me a short time since of our child's preservation let me say our child it will not be for long i shall require your indulgence i felt all the agony of knowing myself irrecoverably ill yet overjoyed to think that the birth of our child would be legitimized that done i shall die happy do not talk thus you will see i shall not deceive you again my death is certain and you will die without one particle of that insatiate ambition which has been your return by what fatality has your repentance been delayed till now though tardy it is sincere and i call heaven to witness that at this awful moment i bless god for removing me from this world and that i am spared the additional misery of living as i am aware i should have been a weight and burden to you as well as a bar to your happiness elsewhere but can you pardon me for mercy's sake say you do do not delay to speak forgiveness and peace to my troubled spirit until the arrival of my child for in her presence you would not choose to pronounce the pardon of her guilty mother it would be to tell her a tale i would fain she never knew you will not refuse me the hope that when i am gone my memory may be dear to her tranquillize yourself she shall know nothing of the past rodolph do you too say i am forgiven 
oh forgive me forgive me can you not pity a creature brought low as i am alas my sufferings might well move your heart to pity and to pardon i do forgive you from my innermost soul said the prince deeply affected the scene was most heart-rending rodolph opened the folding doors and beckoned in the clergyman with the company assembled there that is to say murphy and baron de grone as witnesses on the part of rodolph and the duc de lucenay and lord douglas on the part of the countess thomas satan followed close behind all were impressed with the awful solemnity of the melancholy transaction and even m de lucenay seemed to have lost his usual petulance and folly the contract of marriage between the most high and powerful prince gustave rodolph fifth reigning duke of gerolstein and sarah peyton of halsburg countess macgregor which legitimized the birth of fleur de marie had been previously drawn up by baron de grone and being read by him was signed by the parties mentioned therein as well as duly attested by the signature of their witnesses spite of the countess's repentance when the clergyman in a deep solemn voice inquired of rodolph whether his royal highness was willing to take sarah satan of halsburg countess macgregor for his wife and the prince had replied in a firm distinct voice i will the dying eyes of sarah shone with unearthly brilliancy an expression of haughty triumph passed over her livid features the last flash of expiring ambition not a word was spoken by any of the spectators of this mournful ceremony at the conclusion of which the four witnesses bowing with deep but silent respect to the prince quitted the room brother said sarah in a low voice request the clergyman to accompany you to the adjoining room and to have the goodness to wait there a moment how are you now my dear sister asked satan you look very pale nay replied she with a haggard smile fear not for me am i not grand duchess of gerolstein left alone with rodolph sarah murmured in a feeble and expiring voice while her features underwent a frightful change i am dying my powers are exhausted i shall not live to kiss and bless my child yes yes you will calm yourself she will soon be here it will not be in vain i struggle against the approach of death i feel too surely his icy hand upon me my sight grows dim i can scarcely discern even you sarah cried the prince chafing her damp cold hands with his take courage she will soon be here she cannot delay much longer the almighty has not deemed me worthy of so great a consolation as the presence of my child hark sarah methinks i hear the sound of wheels yes tis she your daughter comes promise me rodolph she shall never know the unnatural conduct of her wretched but repentant mother murmured the countess in almost inarticulate accents the sound of her carriage rolling over the paved court was distinctly heard but the countess had already ceased to recognize what was passing around her her words became more indistinct and incoherent rodolph bent over her with anxious looks he saw the rising films of death veil those beautiful eyes and the exquisite features grow sharp and rigid beneath the touch of the king of terrors forgive me my child let me see my child pardon at least and after death the honours due to my rank she faintly said and these were the last articulate words she uttered the one fixed dominant passion of her life mingled even in her last moments with the sincere repentance she expressed and doubtless felt just at that awful moment murphy entered my lord cried he the princess marie is arrived let her not enter this sad apartment desire satan to bring the clergyman hither then pointing to sarah who was slowly sinking into her last moments rodolph added heaven has refused her the gratification of seeing her child shortly after that the countess sarah macgregor breathed her last End of chapter seven read by celine major chapter eight of the mysteries of paris volume six by eugene Sue 
this librivox recording is in the public domain Bicêtre, part one a fortnight had elapsed since sarah's death and it was mid-lent sunday this date established we will conduct the reader to Bicêtre, an immense building which though originally designed for the reception of insane persons is equally adapted as an asylum for seven or eight hundred poor old men who are admitted into this species of civil invalid hospital when they have reached the age of seventy years or are afflicted with severe infirmities the entrance to Bicêtre is by a large court planted with high trees and covered in the centre by a mossy turf intersected with flower-beds duly cultivated nothing can be imagined more healthful calm or cheerful than the promenade thus devoted to the indigent old beings we have before alluded to around this square are the spacious and airy dormitories containing clean comfortable beds these chambers form the first floor of the building and immediately beneath them are the neatly kept and admirably arranged refectories where the assembled community of Bicêtre partake of their common meal excellent and abundant in its kind and served with a care and attention that reflects the highest praise on the directors of this fine institution in conclusion of this short notice of Bicêtre, we will just add that at the period at which we write the building also served as the abode of condemned criminals who there awaited the period of their execution it was in one of the cells belonging to the prison that the widow martial and calabash were left to count the hours till the following day on which they were to suffer the extreme penalty of the law nicolas the skeleton and several of the same description of ruffians had contrived to escape from la force the very night previous to the day on which they were to have been transferred to Bicêtre. eleven o'clock had just struck as two fiacres drew up before the outer gate from the first of which descended madame georges germain and rigolette and from the second louise morel and her mother germain and rigolette had now been married for some fifteen days we must leave the reader to imagine the glow of happiness that irradiated the fair face of the grisette whose rosy lips parted but to smile or to lavish fond words upon madame georges whom she took every occasion of calling her dear mother the countenance of germain expressed a more calm and settled delight with his sincere affection for the merry-hearted being to whom he was united was mingled a deep and grateful sense of the kind and disinterested conduct of rigolette towards him when in prison although the charming girl herself seemed to have completely forgotten all about it and even when germain spoke of those days she would entreat him to change the subject upon the plea of finding all such recollections so very dull and dispiriting neither would the pretty grisette substitute a bonnet for the smart little cap worn before her marriage and certainly never was humility and avoidance of pretension better rewarded for nothing could have been invented more becoming to the piquant style of rigolette's beauty than the simple cap a la paysanne trimmed with a large orange-coloured rosette at each side contrasting so tastefully with the long tresses of her rich dark hair now worn in long hanging curls for as she said she could not allow herself to take a little pains with her appearance the fair bride wore a handsome worked muslin collar while a scarf of similar colour to the trimmings of her cap half concealed her graceful pliant figure which notwithstanding her having leisure to adorn herself was still unfettered by the artificial restraints of stays although the tight grey silk dress she wore fitted without a fold or a crease over her lightly rounded bosom resembling the beautiful statue of galatea in marble madame georges beheld the happiness of the newly married pair with a delight almost equal to their own as for louise morel she had been set at liberty after undergoing a most searching investigation and when a post-mortem examination of her infant had proved that it had come to its death by natural means but the countenance of the poor victim of another's villainy had lost all the freshness of youth and bore the impress of deep sorrow now softened and subdued by gentleness and resignation thanks to rodolph and the excellent care that had been taken of her through his means the mother of louise who accompanied her had entirely recovered her health madame georges having informed the porter at the lodge that she had called by the desire of one of the medical officers of the establishment who had appointed to meet herself and the friends by whom she was accompanied at half-past eleven o'clock she was requested to choose whether she would await the doctor within doors or in the large square before the building determining to do the latter and supporting herself on the arm of her son while the wife of morel walked beside her she sauntered along the shady alleys that bordered this delightful spot louise and rigolette following them 
how very glad i am to see you again dear louise said the bride when we came to fetch you on our arrival from bougival i wanted to run upstairs to you but my husband would not let me he said i should tire myself so i stayed in the coach and that is the reason why we meet now for the first time since you so kindly came to console me in prison mademoiselle rigolette cried louise deeply affected you are so feeling for all in trouble whether of body or mind in the first place my dear louise replied the grisette hastily interrupting praises that were to her oppressive i am not mademoiselle rigolette any longer but madame germain i do not know whether you heard that you were married oh yes i did but pray let me thank you as you deserve ah but louise persisted madame germain i am quite sure you have not learnt all the particulars how my marriage is all owing to the generosity of him who was at once the protector and benefactor of yourself and family germain his mother and my own self ah yes monsieur rodolphe we bless his name morning and evening when i came out of prison the lawyer who had been to see me from time to time by monsieur rodolphe's order told me that thanks to the same kind friend who had already interested himself so much for us m ferrand and here at the very mention of the name an involuntary shudder passed over the poor girl's frame had settled an annuity on my poor father and myself some little reparation for the wrongs he had done us you are aware that my poor dear father is still confined here though still improving in health and i also know that the kind doctor who has appointed our being here to-day even hopes your dear parent may be enabled to return with you to paris he thinks that it will be better to take some decided steps to throw off this malady and that the unexpected presence of persons your father was in the daily habit of seeing may produce the most favourable effects perhaps cure him and that is what i think will be the case ah mademoiselle i dare not hope for so much happiness madame germain my dear louise if it is all the same to you but to go on with what i was telling you you have no idea i am sure who m rodolphe really is yes i have the friend and protector of all who are unhappy true but that is not all well as i see you really are ignorant of many things concerning our benefactor i will tell you all about it then addressing her husband who was walking before her with madame georges she said don't walk so very fast germain you will tire our mother and with a look of proud satisfaction she said turning to louise does not he deserve to have a good wife see how attentive he is to his mother he certainly is very handsome too a thousand times more so than cabrion or m girandeau the travelling clerk you remember him don't you louise talking of cabrion puts me in mind to ask you whether m pipelet and his wife have arrived yet the doctor wished them to come here to-day with us because your father has talked much about them during his wanderings no they are not here at present but they will not be long when we called for them they had already set out and then as for being punctual in keeping an appointment m pipelet is as exact as a clock to the hour and minute but let me tell you a little more about my marriage and m rodolphe only think louise it was he who sent me with the order for germain's liberation you can imagine our delight at quitting that horrid prison well we went home to my room and there germain and i together prepared a nice little bit of dinner but bless you we might just as well have spared ourselves the trouble for after it was ready neither of us could eat a bit for joy when evening came germain left me promising to return the next day well at five o'clock next morning i got up and sat down to my work for i was terribly behindhand with it as eight o'clock struck some one knocked at the door who should it be but m rodolphe directly i saw him i began to thank him from the bottom of my heart for all he had done for germain and myself he would not allow me to proceed my kind neighbour said he i wish you to give this letter to germain who will soon be here then you will take a fiacre and proceed without delay to a small village near Ecoin called bouqueval once there inquire for madame georges and i wish you all imaginable pleasure from your trip monsieur rodolphe i said pray excuse me but that will make me lose another day's work and i have already got two to make up for make yourself perfectly easy my pretty neighbour said he you will find plenty of work at madame georges i promise you 
she will prove an excellent customer i have no doubt and i have particularly recommended you to her oh that alters the case monsieur rodolph then i'm sure i shall be but glad to go adieu neighbour said monsieur rodolph good-bye cried i and many thanks for so kindly recommending me when germain came i told him all about it so as we were quite sure m rodolph would not send us upon any foolish errand we set off as blithe as birds only imagine louise what a surprise awaited us on our arrival i declare i can scarcely think of it without tears of happiness coming into my eyes we went to the very madame georges you see walking before us and who should she turn out to be but the mother of germain his mother yes his own very mother from whom he had been taken when quite a baby you must try to fancy their mutual joy well when madame georges had wept over her son and embraced and gazed at him a hundred times my turn came to be noticed no doubt m rodolph had written something very favourable about me for clasping me in her arms she said she was acquainted with my conduct towards her son then mother interposed germain it only rests with you to ask her and rigolette will be your child as well as i and i do ask her to be my daughter with all my heart replied his mother for you will never find a better or a prettier creature to love as your wife so there i was quite at home in such a sweet farm along with germain his mother and my birds for i had taken the poor little dear things with me just to hear how delightedly they would sing when they found themselves in the country the days passed like a dream i did only just what i liked helped madame georges walked about with germain and danced and sung like a wild thing well our marriage was fixed to take place on yesterday fortnight the evening before who should arrive but a tall elderly bald-headed gentleman who looked so kind and he brought me a corbeille de mariage from m rodolph only think louise what a beauty it must have been made like a large rosewood box with these words written in letters of gold on medallion of blue china industry and prudence love and happiness and what do you suppose this charming box contained why a number of lace caps similar to the one i have now on pieces for gowns gloves ornaments a beautiful shawl and this pretty scarf oh i thought i should lose my senses with delight but that is not all at the bottom of the box i found a handsome pocket-book with these words written on a bit of paper affixed to it from a friend to a friend inside were two folded papers one addressed to germain and the other to me in that address to germain was an order for his appointment as director of a bank for the poor with a salary of four thousand francs a year while he found under the envelope directed to me a money order for forty thousand francs on the treasury yes that's the word it was called my marriage portion i did not like to take so large a sum but madame georges said to me my dear child you both can and must accept it as a recompense for your prudence industry and devotion to those who were in misfortune for did you not run the risk of injuring your health and probably deprive yourself of your only means of support by sitting up all night at work in order to make up for the time you spent in attending to others oh that is quite true exclaimed louise with fervour i do not think there is any one upon earth who would have done all that you have done madame Wa madame germain there's a good girl she has learned her lesson at last well i said to the elderly gentleman that i did not merit such a reward that what little i had done was purely because it afforded me pleasure to which he answered that makes no difference m rodolph is immensely rich and he sends you this dowry as a mark of his friendship and esteem and your refusal of it would pain him very much indeed he will himself be present at your marriage and then he will compel you to take it what a blessing that so charitable a person as m rodolph should be possessed of such riches of course it is but i haven't told you all yet oh louise you never can guess who and what m rodolph turns out to be and to think of my making him carry large parcels for me but have a little patience you will hear about it directly 
the night before the marriage the elderly gentleman came again very late and in great haste it was to tell us that m rodolph was ill and he could not attend the wedding but that his friend the bald-headed gentleman would take his place and then only my dear louise did we learn that our benefactor was guess what a prince a prince do i say bless you ever so much higher than that a royal highness a reigning duke a sort of a second-rate king germain explained all about his rank to me m rodolph a prince a duke almost a king just think of that louise and imagine my having asked him to help me to clean my room a pretty state of confusion it threw me into when i recollected all that and how free i had spoken to him so of course you know when i found that he was as good as a king i did not dare refuse his gracious wedding present well my dear when we had been married about a week m rodolph sent us word that he should be glad if germain his mother and myself would pay him a wedding visit so we did i can tell you my heart beat as though it would come through my side well we stopped at a fine palace in the rue plumet and were ushered into a number of splendid apartments filled with servants in liveries all covered with gold lace gentlemen in black with silver chains around their necks and swords by their sides officers in rich uniforms and all sorts of gay-looking people the rooms we passed through were all gilt and filled with such beautiful things they quite dazzled my eyesight only to look at them at last we got to the apartment where the ball-headed old gentleman was sitting with a quantity of grand folks all covered with gold lace and embroidery well when our elderly friend saw us he rose and conducted us to an adjoining room where we found m rodolph i mean the prince dressed so simply and looking so good and kind just like the m rodolph we first knew that i did not feel at all frightened at the recollection of how i had set him to pin my shawl for me mend my pens and walked with him arm in arm in the street just like two equals as certainly then i thought we were oh i should have trembled like a leaf if i had been you well i did not mind it at all he smiled so encouragingly and after kindly welcoming madame georges he held out his hand to germain and then said smilingly to me well neighbour and how are papa Cretu and ramonette those were the names i called my birds by was it not kind of him to recollect them i feel quite sure added he that yourself and germain can sing as merry songs as your birds yes indeed my lord replied i madame georges had taught me as we came along how i was to address the prince we are as happy as it is possible to be and our happiness is the greater because we owe it to you nay nay my good child said he you may thank your own excellent qualities and that of germain for the felicity you enjoy etc i need not go on with that part of the story louise because it would oblige me to repeat all the charming praises i received and certainly i cannot recollect ever doing more than my strict duty though the prince was pleased to think differently well we all came away more sorrowful than we went for we found it was to be our farewell visit to our benefactor he being about to return to germany whether or not he has gone i cannot tell you but absent or present our most grateful remembrance and respectful esteem will ever attend him i forgot to tell you that a dear good girl i knew when we were both in prison together had been living at the farm with madame georges it seems my young friend had fortunately found a friend in m rodolph who had placed her there but madame georges particularly cautioned me not to say a word on the subject to the prince who had some reason for desiring it should not be talked about no doubt because he could not bear his benevolent deeds should be known however i learnt one thing that gave me extreme pleasure that my sweet goualeuse had found her parents and that they had taken her a great great way from paris i could not help feeling aggrieved too that i had not been able to wish her good-bye before she went but forgive me dear louise for being so selfish as to keep talking to you of every one's happiness when you have so much reason to be sorrowful yourself had my child but been spared to me said poor louise sadly it would have been some consolation to me for how can i ever hope to find any honest man who would make me his wife 
although i have got money enough to tempt any one for my part louise i feel quite sure that one of these days i shall see you happily married to a good and worthy partner who will pity you for your past troubles and love and esteem you for the patience with which you endured them ah madame germain you only say so to try and comfort me but whether you really believe what you say or no i gratefully feel and thank you for your kindness but who are these i declare monsieur madame pipelet how very gay he looks so different from the sad dejected appearance he always wore while monsieur cabrion was tormenting him as he did louise was right pipelet advanced in high spirits and as though treading on air on his head he wore the well-known bell-crowned hat a superb grass-green coat adorned his person while a white cravat with embroidered ends was folded around his throat in such a manner as to permit the display of an enormous collar reaching nearly up to his eyes and quite concealing his cheeks a large loose waistcoat of bright buff with broad maroon coloured stripes black trousers somewhat short for the wearer snowy white stockings and highly polished shoes completed his equipment anastasie displayed a robe of violet-coloured merino tastefully contrasted with the dark blue shawl she proudly exhibited her freshly curled brutus wig to the gaze of all she met while her cap was slung on her arm by its bright green strings after the manner of a reticule the physiognomy of alfred ordinarily so grave thoughtful and dejected was now mirthful jocund and hilarious the moment he caught a glimpse of rigolette and louise he ran towards them exclaiming in his deep sonorous voice delivered gone how unusually joyful you see monsieur pipelet said rigolette do pray tell us what has occasioned such a change in your appearance gone i tell you mademoiselle or rather madame as i may do and ought to say now that like my anastasie you are tied up for life you are very polite monsieur pipelet but please to tell me who has gone cabrion responded monsieur pipelet inspiring and respiring the air with a look of indescribable delight as though relieved of an enormous weight he has quitted france for ever for a perpetuity at length he has departed and i am myself again are you quite sure he has gone i saw him with my eyes ascend the diligence en route for strasbourg with all his luggage and baggage that is to say a hat-case a mall stick and a box of colours what is my old dear chattering about cried anastasie as she came puffing and panting to the spot where the little group were assembled i'll be bound he was giving you the history of cabrion's going off i am sure he has talked of nothing else all the way we came because i'm half wild with delight i seem to have got into another world such a lightness has come over me a little while ago my hat used to seem as though loaded with lead and as if pressed forwards in spite of me now i seem as though borne on the breeze towards the firmament to think that he is gone actually set out and never to return yes the blackguard is off at last chimed in madame pipelet anastasie cried her husband spare the absent happiness calls for mercy and forbearance on our parts i will obey its dictates and merely allow myself to remark that cabrion was a a worthless scoundrel but how do you know that he has gone to germany inquired rigolette by a friend of our king of lodgers talking of that dear man you haven't heard that owing to the handsome manner in which he recommended us alfred has been appointed house porter to a sort of charitable bank established in our house by a worthy christian who wishes like m rodolphe to do all the good he can ah replied rigolette and perhaps you don't know either that my dear germain is appointed manager of this same bank all owing to the kind intervention of m rodolphe well i never exclaimed madame pipelet all our good luck comes together and i'm sure i'm heartily glad we shall keep old friends and acquaintances around us i hate fresh faces for my part i am certain i would not change my old duck of a husband even for your young handsome one madame germain but to go back to cabrion only imagine a bald-headed stout elderly gentleman coming to tell us of alfred's new situation 
and at the same time inquiring if a talented artist of the name of cabrion did not once lodge in the house with us oh my poor darling directly cabrion's name was mentioned down went the boot he was mending and if i had not caught him he would have swooned away but fortunately the bald gentleman added this young painter had been engaged by a very wealthy person to do some work which will occupy him for years and he may very probably establish himself in another country in confirmation of which the old gentleman gave my alfred the date of cabrion's departure with the address of the office from which he started and i had the unhoped-for satisfaction of reading on the ticket m cabrion artist in painting departs for strasbourg and further by the company's diligence the hour named was for this morning i need not say i was in the inn-yard with my wife and there we saw the rascal take his seat on the box beside the driver just as the vehicle was set in motion cabrion perceived me turned around and cried yours for ever i go to return no more thank heaven the loud blast of the guard's horn nearly drowned these familiar and insulting words as well as any others he might have intended to utter but i pity and forgive the wretched man i can afford to be generous for i am delivered from the bane and misery of my life depend upon it monsieur pipelet said rigolette endeavouring to restrain a loud fit of laughter depend upon it you will see him no more but listen to me and i will tell you something i am sure you are ignorant of and which it will be almost difficult for you to credit what do you think of our monsieur rodolph not being what we took him for but a prince in disguise a royal highness go along with you said anastasie that is a joke oh but really cried rigolette i am not joking it is as true as as that i am married to my dear germain goodness gracious me exclaimed anastasie my king of lodgers a royal highness oh dear here's a pretty go and i asked him to mind the lodge for me oh pardon 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 and then carried away by the excess of her reverence and regret for having so undervalued a prince though a disguised one madame pipelet placed her cap on her head as though she imagined herself in the presence of royalty alfred on the contrary manifested his respect for royalty in a manner diametrically the reverse of the form adopted by his wife snatching off his hat that hat which had never before been seen to quit his head he commenced bowing to empty space as though standing in the presence of the august personage he apostrophized while he exclaimed have i then been honoured by a visit from royalty has my poor lodge been so far favoured and to think of his illustrious eyes having seen me in my bed when driven thither by the vile conduct of cabrion at this moment madame georges turning around cried out my children the doctor comes end of chapter eight part one read by celine major chapter eight part two of the mysteries of paris volume six by eugene sue this librivox recording is in the public domain Bicêtre, part two dr herbin the individual alluded to was a man of about the middle age with a countenance expressive of great kindness and benevolence united to extreme skill and penetration in discovering the extent of malady with which his unfortunate patients were affected his voice naturally harmonious assumed a tone of gentle suavity when he spoke to the poor lunatics who however bereft of reason seemed always to listen with peculiar delight to his soft soothing words which frequently had the effect of subduing the invariable irritability attendant on this fearful complaint m herbin had been among the first to substitute in his treatment of madness sympathy and commiseration for the frightful remedies ordinarily employed he abandoned the course of system so repugnant to every principle of humanity for kind words conciliating looks and a ready attention to every request that could reasonably be granted he banished chains whips drenching with cold water and even solitary confinement except in cases of urgent necessity 
monsieur said madame georges addressing the doctor i have ventured hither with my son and daughter although personally unknown to monsieur morel but my interest in his unfortunate state made me desirous of witnessing the experiment you are about to make to restore his reason you have every hope of succeeding have you not i certainly reckon much madame on the good effects likely to be produced by the sight of his daughter and the persons he has been in the constant habit of seeing when my husband was arrested said morel's wife pointing to rigolette our kind young friend here was nursing me and my children and my father knew monsieur germain quite well said louise then directing the attention of monsieur herbin to alfred and anastasie she added monsieur and madame here were porters at the house and assisted our family to the utmost of their ability i am greatly obliged to you my worthy friend said the doctor addressing alfred for quitting your occupation to come hither but i see by your amiable countenance that you have cheerfully sacrificed your time to visit your poor lodger here sir replied pipelet gravely bowing men should help each other in this sublunary world and remember that all are brothers added to which your unfortunate patient was the very cream and essence of an honest man and therefore do i respect him if you are not afraid madame said dr herbin to madame georges of the sight of the poor creatures here we will cross some of the yards leading to that part of the building where i have deemed it advisable to remove morel instead of allowing him to accompany the others to the farm as usual the farm exclaimed madame georges have you a farm here your surprise is perfectly natural madame yes we have a farm the produce of which is most serviceable to the establishment although entirely worked by the patients is it possible can you make these lunatics work and allow them to be at liberty while they do so certainly exercise the calm tranquillity of the fields with the aspect of nature are among our most certain means of cure only one keeper goes with them and we have rarely had an instance of any patient endeavouring to get away they are delighted to be employed and the trifling reward they gain serves still to improve their condition by enabling them to purchase different little indulgences but we have reached the gate conducting to one of these courts then perceiving a slight appearance of alarm on the countenance of madame georges the doctor added lay aside all apprehension madame in a very few minutes you will feel as tranquil as i do myself i follow you sir come my children anastasie whispered pipelet when i think that had the persecutions of that odious gabrion continued your poor dear alfred might have become mad like the unhappy wretches we are about to behold clad in the most wild and singular state chained up by the middle or confined in dens like the wild beasts in the jardin des plantes oh bless your dear old heart don't talk of such a thing la i have heard say that them as he has gone mad for love are for all the world like born devils directly they see a woman dashing against the bars of their dens and making all sorts of horrid noises till the keepers are forced to flog them till they drop or else turn great taps of water on their heads before they can quiet them anastasie rejoined pipelet gravely i desire you will not go too close to these dreadful creatures an accident so soon happens besides answered anastasie with a tone of sentimental melancholy poor things i have no business to show myself just for the sake of tantalizing them tis woman's beauty and fascination reduces them to this horrid state i declare i feel a cold shudder creep over me as i reflect that perhaps if i had refused to make you a happy man alfred you might at this very minute be raving mad for love and shut up in one of those dens roaring out the moment you caught sight of a woman while as it is my poor old duck is glad to get out of the way of the naughty females that will be trying to make him notice them tis true my modesty is easily alarmed but anastasie the door opens i tremble with dread of what we are about to witness no doubt the most hideous-looking people and all sorts of dreadful noises rattling of chains and grinding of teeth 
the door being opened admitted them into a long courtyard planted with rows of trees under which benches were placed on each side was a well-constructed and spacious portico or covered stone terrace with which a range of large airy cells communicated a number of men all alike clad in a grey dress were walking talking or conversing in this pleasant retreat while others were seated on the benches enjoying the refreshing shade and fresh open air at the sight of dr herbin a number of the unfortunate lunatics pressed around him with every manifestation of joy and delight extending to him their hands with an expression of grateful confidence to which he cordially responded by saying good day good day my worthy fellows i am glad to see you all so well and happy some of the poor lunatics too far from the doctor to be able to seize his hand ventured with a sort of timid hesitation to offer theirs to the persons who were with him good morning friends said germain shaking hands in a manner so cordial as to fill the unfortunate beings with happiness are these the mad patients inquired madame georges nearly the worst belonging to the establishment answered the doctor smiling they are permitted to be together during the day but at night they are locked up in the cells you see there can it be possible that these men are really mad but when are they violent generally at the first outbreak of their malady when they are brought here after a short time the soothing treatment they experience with the society of their companions calms and amuses them so that their paroxysms become milder and less frequent until at length by the blessing of god they recover their senses what are those individuals talking so earnestly about inquired madame georges one of them seems referring to a blind man who in addition to the loss of sight seems likewise deprived of speech and reason have you such a one among your patients or is the existence of this person but a mere coinage of the brain unhappily madame it is a fact but too true and the history connected with it is a most singular one the blind man concerning whom you inquire was found in a low haunt in the champs elysees in which a gang of robbers and murderers of the worst description were apprehended this wretched object was discovered chained in the midst of an underground cave and beside him lay the stretched dead body of a woman so horribly mutilated that it was wholly impossible to attempt to identify it the man himself was hideously ugly his features being quite destroyed by the application of vitriol he has never uttered a single word since he came hither whether his dumbness be real or affected i know not for strange to say his paroxysms always occur during the night and when i am absent so as to baffle all conjecture as to his real situation but his madness seems occasioned by violent rage the cause of which we cannot find out for as i before observed he never speaks or utters an articulate sound but here he is the whole of the party accompanying the doctor started with horror at the sight of the schoolmaster for he it was who merely feigned being dumb and mad to procure his own safety the dead body found beside him was that of the chouette whom he had murdered not during a paroxysm of madness but while under the influence of such a burning fever of the brain as had produced the fearful dream he had dreamed the night he passed at the farm of bouqueval after his apprehension in the vaults of the tavern in the champs elysees the schoolmaster had awakened from his delirium to find himself a prisoner in one of the cells of the conciergerie where mad persons are temporarily placed under restraint hearing all about him speak of him as a raving and dangerous lunatic he resolved to continue to enact the part and even feigned absolute dumbness for the purpose of avoiding the chance of any questions being attempted to be put to him his scheme succeeded when removed to bicetre he affected occasional fits of furious madness taking care always to select the night for these outrageous bursts the better to escape the vigilant eye of the head surgeon the house doctor hastily summoned never arriving in time to witness either the beginning or ending of these attacks the few of his accomplices who knew either his name or the fact of his having escaped from the galleys at rochefort were ignorant of what had become of him and even if they did what interest could they have in denouncing him neither would it have been possible to establish his identity burnt and mutilated as he was with the daring felon of rochefort he hoped therefore by continuing to act the part of a madman to be permitted to abide permanently at bicetre such was now the only desire of the wretch 
unable longer to indulge his appetite for sinful and violent deeds during the solitude in which he lived in bras rouge's cellar remorse gradually insinuated itself into his strong heart and cut off from all communication with the outer world his thoughts fled inwards and presented him with ghastly images of those he had destroyed till his brain burned with its own excited torture and thus this miserable creature still in the full vigour and strength of manhood before whom were doubtless long years of life and enjoying the undisturbed possession of his reason was condemned to linger out the remainder of his days as a self-imposed mute and in the company of fools and madmen or if his imposition was discovered his murderous deeds would conduct him to a scaffold or condemn him to perpetual banishment among a set of villains for whom his newly awakened penitence made him feel the utmost horror the schoolmaster was sitting on a bench a mass of grizzled tangled locks hung around his huge and hideous head leaning his elbow on his knee he supported his cheek in his hand spite of his sightless eyes and mutilated features the revolting countenance still expressed the most bitter and overwhelming despair dear mother observed germain what a wretched-looking object is this unfortunate blind man oh yes my son answered madame georges it makes one's heart ache to behold a fellow-creature so heavily afflicted i know not when anything has so completely shocked me as the sight of this deplorable being scarcely had madame georges given utterance to these words than the schoolmaster started and his countenance even despite its cicatrized and disfigured state became of an ashy paleness he rose and turned his head in the direction of madame georges so suddenly that she could not refrain from faintly screaming though wholly unsuspicious of who the frightful creature really was but the schoolmaster's ear had readily detected the voice of his wife and her words told him she was addressing her son mother inquired germain what ails you are you ill nothing my son but the sudden movement made by that man terrified me indeed sir continued she addressing the doctor i begin to feel sorry i allowed my curiosity to bring me hither nay dear mother just for once to see such a place cannot hurt you i tell you what germain interposed rigolette i don't feel very comfortable myself and i promise you neither your mother nor i will desire to come here again it is too affecting nonsense you are a little coward is she not monsieur le docteur why really answered monsieur herbin i must confess that the sight of this blind lunatic affects even me who am accustomed to such things what a scarecrow old ducky isn't he whispered anastasie but la to my eyes every man looks as hideous as this dreadful blind creature in comparison with you and that is why no one can ever boast of my having granted him the least liberty don't you see alfred i tell you what anastasie replied pipelet i shall dream of this frightful figure i know he will give me an attack of nightmare i won't eat tripe for supper till i have quite forgot him and how do you find yourself now friend asked the doctor of the schoolmaster but he asked in vain no attempt was made to reply come come continued the doctor tapping him lightly on the shoulder i am sure you hear what i say try to make me a sign at least or speak something tells me you can if you will but the only answer made to this address was by the schoolmaster suddenly drooping his head while from the sightless eyes rolled a tear he weeps exclaimed the doctor poor creature murmured germain in a compassionate tone the schoolmaster shuddered again he heard the voice of his son breathing forth commiseration for his wretched though unknown parent what is the matter inquired the doctor what is it that grieves you but without taking any notice of him the schoolmaster hid his face with his hands we shall make nothing of him said the doctor then perceiving how painfully this scene appeared to affect madame georges he added now then madame we will go to morel and if my expectations are fulfilled you will be amply rewarded for the pain you have felt hitherto in witnessing the joy of so good a husband and father in being restored to his family with these words the doctor followed by the party that had accompanied him proceeded on his way leaving the schoolmaster a prey to his own distracting thoughts 
the most bitter of which was the certainty of having heard his son's voice and that of his wife for the last time aware of the just horror with which he inspired them the misery shame and affright with which they would have heard the disclosure of his name made him prefer a thousand deaths to such a revelation one only but great consolation remained in the certainty of having awakened the pity of his son and with this thought to comfort him the miserable being determined to endure his sufferings with repentance and submission we are now about to pass by the yard appropriated to the use of the idiot patients said the doctor stopping before a large grated door through which the poor idiotic beings might be seen huddled together with every appearance of the most distressing imbecility spite of madame georges's recent agitation she could not refrain from casting a glance through the railing poor creatures said she in a gentle pitying voice how dreadful to think their sufferings are hopeless for i presume there is no remedy for such an affliction as theirs alas none madame replied the doctor but i must not allow you to dwell too long on this mournful picture of human misery we have now arrived at the place where i expect to find morel whom i desired should be left entirely alone in order to produce a more startling effect in the little project on which i build my hopes for his restoration to reason what idea principally occupies his mind asked madame georges he believes that if he cannot earn thirteen hundred francs by his day's work in order to pay off a debt contracted with one ferrand a notary his daughter will perish on a scaffold that man ferrand was indeed a monster exclaimed madame georges poor louise morel and her father were not the only victims to his villainy he has persecuted my son with the bitterest animosity i have heard the whole story from louise replied the doctor happily the wretch can no more wring your hearts with agony but be so good as to await me here while i go to ascertain the state of morel then addressing louise he added you must carefully watch for my calling out come appear instantly but let it be alone when i call out come for the second time the rest of the party may make their appearance alas sir my heart begins to fail me replied louise endeavouring to suppress her tears my poor father what if the present trial fail nay nay keep up your courage i am most sanguine of success in the scheme i have long meditated for the restoration of your father's reason now then all you have to do for the present is carefully to attend to my directions so saying the doctor quitting his party entered a small chamber whose grated window looked into the garden thanks to rest care sufficiency of nourishing diet morel was no longer the pale careworn haggard creature that had entered those walls the tinge of health began to colour his before jaundiced cheek but a melancholy smile a fixed motionless gaze as though on some object for ever present to his mental view proved too plainly that reason had not entirely resumed her empire over him when the doctor entered morel was sitting at a table imitating the movements of a lapidary at his wheel i must work murmured he and hard too thirteen hundred francs ay thirteen hundred is the sum required or poor louise will be dragged to a scaffold that must not be no no her father will work 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 thirteen hundred francs right morel my good fellow said the doctor gently advancing towards him don't work so very hard there is no occasion now you know that you have earned the thirteen hundred francs you required to free louise see here they are and with these words the doctor laid a handful of gold on the table saved louise saved exclaimed the lapidary catching up the money and hurrying towards the door then i will carry it at once to the notary come called out the doctor in considerable trepidation for well he knew the success of his experiment depended on the manner in which the mind of the lapidary received its first shock scarcely had the doctor pronounced the signal than louise sprang forwards and presented herself at the door just as her father reached it bewildered and amazed morel let fall the gold he clutched in his hands and retreated in visible surprise for some minutes he continued gazing on his daughter with a stupefied and vacant stare but by degrees his memory seemed to awaken 
and cautiously approaching her he examined her features with a timid and restless curiosity poor louise trembling with emotion could scarcely restrain her tears but a sign from the doctor made her exert herself to repress any manifestation of feeling calculated to disturb the progress of her parents thoughts meanwhile morel bending over his daughter and peering with uneasy scrutiny into her countenance became very pale pressed his hands to his brows and then wiped away the large damp drops that had gathered there drawing closer and closer to the agitated girl he strove to speak to her but the words expired on his lips his paleness increased and he gazed around him with the bewildered air of a person awakening from a troubled dream good good whispered the doctor to louise now when i say come throw yourself into his arms and call him father the lapidary pressing his two hands on his breast again commenced examining the individual before him from head to foot as if determined to satisfy his mind as to her identity his features expressed a painful uncertainty and instead of continuing to watch the features of his daughter he seemed as if trying to hide himself from her sight saying in a low murmuring broken tone no no it is a dream where am i it is impossible i dream it cannot be she then observing the gold strewed on the floor he cried and this gold i do not remember am i then awake oh my head is dizzy i dare not look i am ashamed she is not my louise come cried the doctor in a loud voice father dearest father exclaimed louise do you not know your child your poor louise and as she said these words she threw herself on the lapidary's neck while the doctor motioned for the rest of the group to advance gracious heavens exclaimed morel while louise loaded him with caresses where am i what has happened to me who are all these persons oh i cannot dare not believe the reality of what i see then after a short silence he abruptly took the head of louise between his two hands gazed earnestly and searchingly at her for some moments then cried in a voice tremulous with emotion louise he is saved said the doctor my dear morel my dear husband exclaimed the lapidary's wife mingling her caresses with those of her daughter my wife my child and wife both here cried morel pray don't overlook the rest of your friends monsieur morel said rigolette advancing see we have all come to visit you at once i for one am delighted to renew my acquaintance with the worthy monsieur morel said germain coming forward and extending his hand and your old acquaintances at the lodge beg that they may not be overlooked chimed in anastasie leading alfred up to the astonished and delighted lapidary you know us don't you monsieur morel the piplets the hearty old piplets and your everlasting friends come pluck up your courage and look about you monsieur morel hang it all daddy morel here is a happy meeting may we see many such allez donc monsieur piplet and his wife everybody here it seems to me so long since but but no matter tis you louise my child tis you is it not exclaimed he joyfully pressing his daughter in his arms oh yes my dearest father tis your own poor louise and there is my mother here are all our kind friends you will never quit us more never know sorrow or care again and henceforward we shall all be happy and prosperous happy let me try and recollect a little of past things i seem to have a faint recollection of your being taken to prison and and then louise all seems a blank and confusion here continued morel pressing his hand to his temples never mind all that dearest father i am here and innocent let that comfort and console you stay stay that note of hand i gave and now i remember it all cried the lapidary with shuddering horror then in a voice of assumed calmness he said and what has become of the notary he is dead dearest father murmured louise dead 
he dead then indeed i may hope for happiness but where am i how came i here how long have i left my home and wherefore was i brought hither i have no recollection of any of these things you were extremely ill said the doctor and you were brought here for air and good nursing you have had a severe fever and been at times a little light-headed yes yes i recollect now and when i was taken ill i remember i was talking to my daughter and some other person who could it be ah now i know a kind good man named m rodolph who saved me from being arrested afterwards strange to say i cannot recall a single circumstance your illness was attended with an entire absence of memory said the doctor and in whose house am i now in that of your friend m rodolph interposed germain hastily it was thought that country air would be serviceable to you and promote your recovery excellent said the doctor in a low tone then speaking to a keeper who stood near him he said send the coach around to the garden gate to prevent the necessity of taking our recovered patient through the different courts filled with those less fortunate than himself as frequently occurs in cases of madness morel had not the least idea or recollection of the aberration of intellect under which he had suffered shortly afterwards morel with his wife and daughter ascended the fiacre attended also by a surgeon of the establishment who for precaution's sake was charged to see him comfortably settled in his abode ere he left him and in this order and followed by a second carriage conveying their friends the lapidary quitted bicetre without entertaining the most remote suspicion of ever having entered it and do you consider this poor man effectually cured asked madame georges of the doctor as he led her to the coach i hope so at least and i wish to leave him wholly to the beneficial effects of rejoining his family from whom it would now be almost dangerous to attempt to separate him added to which one of my pupils will remain with him and give the necessary directions for his regimen and treatment i shall visit him myself daily until his cure is confirmed for not only do i feel much interested in him but he was most particularly recommended to me when he first came here by the charge d'affaires of the grand duke of gerolstein a look of intelligence was exchanged between germain and his mother much affected with all they had seen and heard the party now took leave of the doctor reiterating their gratification at having been present during so gratifying a scene and their grateful acknowledgments for the politeness he had shown them in conducting them over the establishment as the doctor was re-entering the house he was met by one of the superior officers of the place who said to him ah my dear monsieur herbin you cannot imagine the scene i have just witnessed it would have afforded an inexhaustible fund of reflection for so skilful an observer as yourself to what do you allude you are aware that we have here two females a mother and a daughter who are condemned to death and that their execution is fixed for to-morrow well in my life i never witnessed such a cool indifference as that displayed by the mother she must be a female fiend you allude to the widow martial i presume what fresh act of daring has she committed you shall hear she had requested permission to share her daughter's cell until the final moment arrived her wish was complied with her daughter far less hardened than her parent appeared to feel contrition as the hour of execution approached while the diabolical assurance of the old woman seemed if possible to augment just now the venerable chaplain of the prison entered their dungeon to offer them the consolations of religion the daughter was about to accept them when the mother without for one instant losing her coolness or frigid self-possession began to assail the chaplain with such insulting and derisive language that the venerable priest was compelled to quit the cell after trying in vain to induce the violent and unmanageable woman to listen to one word he said it is a fearful fact connected with this family that a sort of depravity seems to pervade it the father was executed a son is now in the galleys a second has only escaped a public and disgraceful end by flight while the eldest son and two young children have alone been able to resist this atmosphere of moral contagion what a singular circumstance connected with this double execution it is that the day of mid-lent should have been selected at seven o'clock to-morrow 
the hour fixed the streets will be filled with groups of masqueraders who having passed the night at the different balls and places of entertainment beyond the barriers will be just returning home added to which at the place of execution the barriere st jacques the noise of the revels still being kept up in honour of the carnival can be distinctly heard the following morning's sun rose bright and cloudless at four o'clock in the morning various troops of soldiers surrounded the approaches to bicetre we shall now return to calabash and her mother in their dungeon End of chapter eight read by celine major